always good to worship God. Yeah, I was very... Can I have those words for a second, please? I need those. The last song. While we were singing, there was something that really struck me. And this kind of ties into... <clears throat> I always find this really amazing. Um, whenever... I end up in Frontier for whatever reason. And I don't choose the songs. The songs kind of always fit in with the message I'm bringing. It's just amazing how God works it. And this morning, as we were singing this, there's a verse there that goes, And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. How amazing is that? And, I mean, that's kind of, just, can you imagine everyone in heaven just, what's going to happen now? Waiting to see. The stone was moved for good and Jesus rose again. And suddenly, the entire universe changed forever. Nothing would ever be the same again. And that just really struck me. It was like, at that moment, it was just, things changed forever. Right. It was just an aside. So this morning... Um, I've noticed, first of all, let's open in prayer, sorry. Father God, thank you for this time that we can spend together as a congregation, just being in your presence and, and seeking you. Thank you that we can have that privilege, Lord. Thank you for your mercy, thank you for your grace towards us. I ask that you would use me as your instrument this morning, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that you would open hearts spiritual hearts and that the words that you bring this morning through me fall on fertile ground I ask this in Jesus name Amen. so I've been noticing that there's been a hunger in people and I've noticed this in speaking to people after service or like at the bra the other day and at uh, Connect Group, I see the questions that are being asked, and I hear the comments that are being made. People are hungering for more. They're hungry for more. They want a deeper relationship with God. They, they've kind of, at a point in their lives where they really want to get in deeper and, and, and really get to the meaty parts of things. And they want to be further along in their Christian walk. They want to be more mature. Um, and so I went to the Word to discover how do we do that? Um, how do we go deeper in our Christian walk? You know, it's very easy <clears throat> when someone asks you, how do you go deeper in your Christian walk? I mean, we'll all have an answer. Some people will say, well, you should pray more. And some people will say, well, you read your Bible more. Some people will say, spend more time with Christian friends so that their influence kind of rubs off on you. Um, and there will be a myriad of different answers. But it amazed me that the Bible actually has very clear instructions on this. Very clear. <coughs> so let's think about this for a moment. All of those who are married or have been married for a while um, will know that when you start courting uh, your spouse, you want to know everything about them. You want to know what food they like, um, what their favorite color is, um, are they a cat person or a dog person, do they even like animals? Um, and why do we do that? We do that because we want to put our best foot forward when we're dealing with that person. For example, if Tanya, if I ask Tanya, would you like something warm to drink? And she says, yes, please. I'm going to be pretty safe assuming that I can make her a cup of tea and she'll be happy. Because I know she prefers tea to coffee. And in the same way, we get to know Christ. When we accept Christ as our Savior for the first time, 
um, we're excited by it. We spend time in the Bible. We read the Bible. We discuss Christ with other people all the time. We, it's, it's very much the same way as courting your spouse. You're excited by it. And, and, and you want to share that excitement. You know, when you, when you meet your spouse for the first time, and you're standing around the bra if you're a guy, or if you are um, having tea with friends if you're a lady, you tell each other um, that I've met this person and, yeah, I think I'm in love and, and they excite me. I, I like being around them. It's, it's, it makes me feel good. It's, it's how it happens. And when we meet Christ for the first time, exactly the same thing happens. One of my friends once said to me, who happens to be a pastor, he said, new Christians are quite scary. He says, because they, they want to pray for everything that moves, and if it doesn't move, they pray for it until it moves, and then they pray for it. <laughs> and yeah, a person also has to do, there is balance in everything. Eh? But as one becomes a bit more mature in your walk, we tend to find, excuse me, we tend to find that just like human relationships, um, things become a bit stale. Now, maybe it's just me, and I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand at this point, but I'm already getting a couple of smiles, so I know I'm on the right track. But after a couple of years of being married, things become, you get to know each other very well, and you kind of already start anticipating what the other person is going to ask. And so you answer even before the other person asks you, because you know each other really well. But that makes you hit a ceiling. It puts you on a plateau. Because now you stop learning the deeper things, because you think you know everything. And it's like that in our Christian walk as well. I think most of us here, if we if we had to ask someone, or if someone had to ask us basic Christian questions like, what do I need to be saved? Um, who is Jesus? We'd all have an answer. But if someone asks a really difficult question, I don't know, something like, something obscure, what roles do cherubim play in the Bible? We probably wouldn't have an answer. And the reason is, is because we're at that plateau. But I'm sensing amongst lots of people here in this congregation that people want to move past that. They want to get to a point where they can answer those difficult questions. Where they can turn around and say to God, Lord, I love you so much. So this morning, we're going to look at John chapter 14. I did print those out for you, for those who don't have Bibles. To find the answer on how to do that. So just to give some context um, around this book and this chapter. So this book was written by John the Apostle. Now everyone confuses John the Baptist and John the Apostle. John the Apostle was a follower of John the Baptist before Christ began his ministry. And I'm reading this because I don't want to get the facts wrong, so bear with me. He became a, an apostle or a follower of Jesus after that. Um, he was the son of Zebedee and a brother to James. And this book was written 85 to 90 AD, when John was already an old man. Um, and his intended audience, he wrote this book for new Christians and searching non-Christians. That was his intended audience for the book. This bit that I'm going to read next is quite important. It was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, I think. Um, but before, John was exiled to the island of Patmos. And that's important because when he wrote this book, he was dealing with people who were still waiting for the Savior, even though Jesus had been amongst them. There were still the Israelites waiting to be saved. And instead of getting a savior, they had their capital 
sacked and ruined and destroyed, which made it very difficult for John to get the message across. I mean, imagine trying to say to someone, but guys, it's all right. Don't worry, things are going to be fine. And your capital city <coughs> has been destroyed. Um, it was a difficult time for him to try and get this message across. And so the way that he got it across, we'll see as we progress, is he used love. He used love. You know, when we... There's a very nice um, idiom in Afrikaans. It says, Lat iemand op sy neus kijk. So if you are in an argument and you kind of make the other person feel shy, then they look down because, and you let them up say, yes, good. And I think it's such a descriptive thing. And so what I wanted to say around that was that when you find yourself in a situation like, like John did, the easiest way to avoid an argument is to agree with a person. So if someone comes to you and says, you're a blinking fool, man, so, yeah, probably. I've done some foolish things in my life. And that person has no ammunition. They can't say anything. And what happens? They let them off send back. But, that's a bit of an aside. The important part to understanding this deeper relationship and how we get it with God is in verse 1 to 7 of John 14. I'm going to read that quickly. It says, and this is John saying to these guys who've just had their capital destroyed. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Yo. Imagine that. Someone's come along, they've just bombed your city. I'm thinking of the conflict in Russia at the moment. Imagine going into one of those cities that have just been bombed. Saying, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Difficult thing to do. What kind of faith what kind of strength of conviction must you have to be able to do that? John was a man of conviction. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. This is Jesus talking, by the way. Um, as many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there to be a place for you. I thought we were about to take off here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. Now, that's quite important. He's saying to these guys, you know how to get there. But what happens? Thomas, we all know the story about doubting Thomas. Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now, let's just think about that for a minute. For the last three and a half years, Jesus has been with the disciples. He's taught them. He said, he's shown them. He's gone and performed miracles in front of them. He's given them the power to go out and perform miracles. And Thomas says, how do we know the way? He still doesn't see it. He's lived it and he still doesn't see it. And here's key one. So this is the very first key to understanding how to get deeper, a deeper relationship with God. Jesus answered, I'm the way and the truth and the life. This is a, a verse we all know very well. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do, you do know him and have seen him. So what is Jesus saying there? He's essentially saying, I'm God. I'm part of the triune God. At that point, he's like done with teaching. He's done with equipping. He's done with trying to make people see. He's saying, here I am. I'm God. I'm part of the, the Godhead, three in one. He's done playing games now. And at that point, he gives us the key. Saying, you can get to God, my Father, but you have to come through me. Right. So that's key one. And keep that in mind. There's, there's, three, there's three very important keys here. So, 
Well, Doubting Thomas, like many people today also, I guess, um, he believed, but he didn't know what, to what extent he believed. Or even if he was believing in the right thing. He, he was still doubting. He'd seen all these things and still, yeah, he just couldn't put all his faith in. He kept questioning. And I think today people are like that as well. And maybe even a bit more. You know, the disciples had Jesus with them. He was performing miracles. He was talking with people. He was encouraging people. And today we come to church and we don't see Jesus as a human figure here with us. We have to do what they did on faith. And we told in the Bible that we have to do that on faith. But the point that I'm trying to make is that Thomas has this distinction of being the doubting Thomas. But I don't think it should have been Thomas. I think it should have been Philip. Because if we read a little bit further, uh, just bear with me for a second. Oh, I've lost my notes on that one. But Philip, um, if you read further on in there, you'll find it. It says, Jesus, just show us the Father. Then we'll believe you. So now he has a guy who's saying to Jesus, okay, I, I get all the stuff that you've been teaching me. I've seen all these miracles you've done. You're a really good guy. I believe 90% in you. Um, we, we, we're behind you 90%. But just show us the Father, and then we'll be behind you 100%. <clears throat> He's still doubting. So I, personally, I think it should have been doubting Philip, not doubting Thomas, but anyway. And then, in verse 15 to 18, there's the second key, where Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. So verse 15 is the actual key. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. I thought, I mean, I've read that verse so many times, and I always thought what he means is keep my commandments, the Ten Commandments. Because remember, just before this, Jesus reveals himself as being part of the triune God. So now he has God's authority to say, keep my commands. So in my head, it was always, well, keep the Ten Commandments. But actually it's not. Let's read a bit further. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. Now this I find very interesting. The world cannot accept him. Speaking about the spirit of truth here. The world, in other words the people who don't believe, cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. So he's saying to them again, guys, you know who you're dealing with here. I've been with you all this time. He lives with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He's promising us that he will not leave us as orphans. Right. This is the part actually that I think that blew me away the most. Um, because... In Matthew 22, I also printed that a bit further on. Um, someone actually asks Jesus that very question. One of the Pharisees um, says to, to Jesus, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So I always thought the Ten Commandments is what's being referred to here, but Jesus gave a different answer when someone asked him that question directly. And Jesus responds with another verse we know very well, which is um, Matthew 22, uh, verse 37 to 40. It says, Jesus, uh, we know it's Jesus speaking, because it starts with Jesus replied. 
So Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, and then he gives us a bit more. He says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Just consider that for a moment. All the Jewish law, all the prophets in the Old Testament, which had been there, hang on those two commandments. Right. That's key number two. So we've had one key that we can get to God through Jesus. The second key is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor. We know God, so it's easy. We know who God is. We understand who God is. And so it's easy to understand the first part of that instruction, where he says, love your God, love God with all your mind, soul, body, strength, depending on which translation you're looking at. But then he says, love your neighbor. It's the second part of it. So who's our neighbor? Well, strangely enough, someone asked Jesus that exact question. And it was in Luke um, 10, verse 25 to 37. I'm not going to read that to you. I'll leave that to you as homework. So when you get home, put out your Bibles and go and read. Make a note of Luke 10, verse 25 to 37. <coughs> So, uh, and the actual question was asked, Luke 10, verse 29. And it was a lawyer, it was a Sadducee. And he says to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who should we consider as neighbors? And Jesus answers by telling the parable of um, the Good Samaritan. Now that's quite important, because remember that the Jewish nation saw themselves as God's chosen nation. And they, they are. I mean, the Bible tells us that, that the uh, Jewish nation is the apple of God's eye. We know this. But at that time, they didn't understand who Jesus was. So they, were, they thought they had this elevated privilege somehow. Something over and above that the other guys had. <coughs> and the parable of the Good Samaritan is very important because the Samaritan was not a Jewish person. The Samaritans were not seen as Jewish. So, in fact, they were a completely different nation. And yet the Samaritan helped a Jew. And that was the lesson in the story, was that it doesn't matter who you are. We are all neighbors. It doesn't matter if you know the person. It doesn't matter if they're a different creed. It doesn't matter if they're a different religion. It doesn't matter if they're a different race. They're our neighbors. That was the lesson that, that Christ gave in, in that parable. Basically, I guess it boils down to everyone is your neighbor. Um, that both Jews and non-Jews in that particular parable should regard each other as neighbors, which means that everyone is a neighbor. Right. So getting back to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What does that actually mean? Let's just unpack that a little bit. So if you love God with all your heart, that's with your emotion. Remember the story I told in the beginning of when you meet someone for the first time and you're so excited? That's the emotion part. That's the bit that gives you the warm and fuzzy feeling. And Tony's never had that. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm picking on you today. <laughs> That's the bit that makes you feel good. It's the emotional side of it. All your soul. What is our soul? Our soul is our spiritual side. It's the side of us which connects directly with God. It's the side of us that, and I've, and I've used this 
illustration so often because it's happened to me quite often. Have any of you ever walked into a room and as you walk in, you just realize, you get this feeling I shouldn't be here? Anyone? Happened to anyone? It happened to me quite often. We, I walk into a place and I just, oh, there's something here, I shouldn't be here. And usually I leave. Um, I don't always, and I usually end up getting myself in trouble when I don't. Um, that's the spiritual side where people connect with God. And God is talking to you through that spiritual side. He's saying, don't go there. I'm looking out for you. I'm warning you. It's a bad place to be. But if you're not aware of that, if you're not aware of that spiritual side of, your, of things, you're only connecting with God with two-thirds of things. You're not connecting on that third level. The third one is your mind. What is our minds? Our minds are our intellect, the bit that we reason with. When someone comes to us and says to us, um, one plus one is three, we know one plus one isn't three. We can reason that out. And so when someone comes to you and gives you a statement out of the Bible and says, oh, but the Bible says this, we should have the maturity to be able to use our intellect to go and reason, reason it out and say to the person, oh, hold on, you misquoting this. Money isn't the root of all evil, for example. The love of money is. The Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. We should have that intellect to be able to go and reason and know these things. So we've got three, I'm putting this in inverted commas, weapons at our disposal to draw closer to God. Three tools, let me rather say that. Three tools, three ways of doing it. And it's important that we nurture each of those. So how do we do that? Our emotion is easy because emotion is kind of what drives us as human beings. So when we get excited about God, um, it's easy to maintain that excitement. The spiritual side of it is an awareness. It's, it's being aware of God. It's being, it's listening and taking heed. You know, very often I've had people come up to me and say something to me which makes me think, how did this person know to say that to me? And years later, I'll speak to them about the incident, and I'll say to them, why did you say that to me? And I'll say, because God prompted me to. It, it was my spiritual being. And nine times out of ten, when I look back, I'm so grateful for that, because people warned me. Now, that doesn't mean that you should believe everything everyone says, because some people will believe that they are directly connected to God and they're going to give you this prophecy and you will it doesn't work like that a person can a discerning spirit will know when that is happening and that's the other part of that spiritual maturity we're talking about a person needs to be careful uh, tele-evangelists love doing that um, you know, they, they stand up there and they like, don't worry, name it and claim it. Um, things will be fine. Don't worry, just ask for it, you'll get it. It doesn't work like that. God is not a genie. <laughs> it's like, here's this lantern and you rub it and out pops a genie and you get three wishes. God doesn't work like that. Um, but now in closing, oh, by the way, I've just I suddenly realized, you guys must have all been really naughty this week to get to listen to me for half an hour. <laughs> but anyway. <clears throat> anyway, and in closing, now that we know what to do to draw nearer to God, the question becomes, how do we do it? So in Matthew 10, verse 5 to 8, Jesus is giving the disciples final instructions on going out to go and evangelize and to, and to spread the gospel. And in Matthew 10, verse 7, 
He says, as you go, proclaim this message. So now he's sending him out. He says, off you go. Go and spread the word. Proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And then he gives him an instruction. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy. Leprosy in old times was a really bad disease to have. They shunned you. They put you in isolation. It was, and it was rife in those, in those years. Um, cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. I mean, Jesus gave his disciples the authority to drive out demons and they still didn't get it. They've been given that authority and they still didn't see him for who he was. But this is the part that I want you to listen to. Freely you have received. Freely give. Now, <clears throat> if you go and read that verse on its own like that, um, it sounds like what he's saying is, I've freely given you these gifts. You freely go and give an extension of those gifts to other people. And yes, that is partly what he's saying. But I think if you read between the lines, he's also talking about other spiritual gifts which people have been given. And the biggest spiritual gift which any saved Christian has been given is the gift of grace. If God wasn't graceful enough towards us to send His Son to pay the price for our brokenness and our sins, then we would still be lost. Just think about that for a moment. God said, I love you guys so much. Here's my Son. I'm sending Him as an intermediary offering so that you don't have to pay the price. So that I don't have to pay the price. That's quite a thing. And if we've been given that grace freely, who are we to withhold that grace from others? So next time you're standing in the, the queue at Pick and Pay and you're in a hurry and you want to get out there and the teller's taking a bit long to ring up your stuff, don't get angry. Have a little bit of grace because you don't know what they're going through. They might have a sick child at home and they're worried and they're not concentrating. They might have illness in the family. Have grace. Be graceful towards people. I know that as humans we tend to judge very easily because <laughs> nine times out of ten we're actually judging ourselves. <clears throat> we see our own weaknesses and our own mistakes and so we go, oh, look at that guy. We're actually not judging that because we're judging ourselves. So be graceful towards yourself too. Be graceful towards yourself too. That's important. That's the very first step, actually. If you can't have grace towards yourself and say, I realize that I'm a broken person. I realize that I am... I've done so many wrong things. I realize that I need that salvation. That's the first step. Because then you can extend that grace to someone else. And in extending that grace to someone else, that person sees God's grace in you, which draws that person nearer to God, but God also draws you nearer because you've extended that grace. So, if you want to know how to draw nearer to God, three-step plan. Right. Love him with your entire being. Be graceful towards one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's actually quite easy. I think the reason people get lost with this, it's a very easy message actually, but I think the reason that people get lost with this, trying to understand how to draw nearer to God, is because the answers aren't written concurrently in one book. They are given in three different books. I've given you those three books to go and look at and on those notes. And if, if you'd like to dive a bit, bit deeper into this, um, that's a good starting point. Um, I hope I've encouraged you, because I can see that there's, a, that there's a yearning in people to, to get deeper. 
<coughs> excuse me, if there's anyone here, you know, that very first step, that emotion step that, that we spoke about earlier, if there's anyone here who's never taken that first step, who, who you know, <coughs> I used to have a, a business in Grahamstown. I had a guy working for me. He's passed on now. His name was Shane Fulun. <coughs> Excuse me. And Shane was a a heavy drug user. He um, was a heavy drinker. Um, he had, um, he came to me out of the blue one day and said, I'm a drug addict and I need a job. So I said, all right, we'll pull in. Let's see how you do. And uh, he worked for me for about five years. Very hard worker. Um, very intelligent guy. Could quote the Bible backwards to you. Knew everything. He knew the answers. You could ask him a question. What do you think about this in the Bible? And he'd have the right answer. No emotion. No connection. He had all the intellect and no emotion. So if there's anyone here who's never experienced that emotion, who's never drawn that close to Christ, <clears throat> and you want to come to see me afterwards, I'll pray with you. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with me, Tanya will pray with you. And if you don't feel comfortable with either of us, next week, Johan and Sophia will be back, and I'm sure they'll, they'll pray with you. But if there's someone who, who feels that this is the moment, don't hesitate. It's life-changing stuff. It's, it's stuff which I might be preaching to the choir here, but if there is anyone, feel free. Whenever I... How did I end up here this morning? As Peter told you, um, Sophia and Johanna are in PE, and three weeks ago already he came to me and he said, look, we better plan just in case. And I prepared a different message for two weeks ago, which was when we kind of sort of thought I would possibly be here. And that message wasn't the right message for the following week. We weren't sure if Sean was coming, so I prepared another message um, because it was kind of what I felt was right. And then during the week, this is the message that came to me. And so I hope that it's encouraged you. I hope that, that as you think on these things, that you that you take them in, that you make them part of you, that you, I can see a yearning in people. They want to go deeper, they want to, I can see it. I, I, every week I'm blown away when I, when I go to, um, to Bible study, um, to connect group, listening to answers and listening to questions that people ask. It's like each, each week is a, is a step further. It's like people are growing in leaps and bounds. Things are, are People are coming alive. It's so exciting. It's so exciting, this, this church. There are not many people here today, and I believe that's for a reason. Um, but thank you for your grace towards me and listening to me this morning. I appreciate it. Whenever I have the privilege of, of bringing a message, I like ending with a, a benediction. I know it's old school, but... I like doing it because it's, it's, for me, it's comforting somehow. And so may God's grace, peace, and love be with all of us as we continue to think on and read and pray about this to gain a greater understanding. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for these precious people that were here this morning. Ask, Lord, that you would be with each one of them in this coming week. Ask, Father, that you would reveal yourself to them deeply as they need it, Lord. You know where we are, each of us, in our walk with you. And we ask, Father, that you would hold your hand of, of comfort over us, your hand of protection. And so as we go into this week, Lord, we ask that you would make us more aware of you. And we thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace towards us. In Jesus' name, amen.